humans can live forever in Futurama, one of my favorite science fiction TV shows set in the 31st century. However, there is a catch. Medical advances have enabled humans to live until the age of 160, after which they are ferried to the near death star. There, they rest in coffin-like chambers and upload their consciousness into a virtual 3D world where they continue to live. Now, to visit the yourself would have to put on a headset that would transport you into this digital world of ones and zeros. Definitely one of the more interesting retirement homes, won't you say? Now, the headset used in Futurama is an example of a brain-machine interface device. An adapter that creates a communication channel between the human brain and the computer-simulated world. Now, let's rewind a thousand years from the 31st century to the present, where we don't live forever, but already have brain technologies that are helping improve our lives. Neuroscience, the study of the human brain and the nervous system, has been seeing a recent surge of research interest in the past 50 years. Between 2012 and 2014, for instance, it has seen an increase of 105% in the number of research publications. With growing understanding of the human brain, we are able to create neurotechnologies that are taking advantage of interesting behaviors of the nervous system. At the same time, these neurotechnologies are helping enhance our understanding of the human brain. Now, imagine waking up one day with a pair of x-ray eyes, a hat that can plug you directly into the internet, and an extra pair of limbs that make you run faster than a cheetah. This is the kind of future that neurotechnology could enable. Now, in the next several minutes, let's dive into some of these interesting uh, neurotechnologies that have recently been developed, but are already changing lives around the world. My first foray into this exciting world of neurotech was through a sensory substitution project called VEST. Sensory substitution is the technique, it's a non-invasive technique of circumventing the loss of one sense, such as hearing, by feeding its information to the brain through another sense, such as touch. It is based on the idea that sensation is separate from perception. That is, when you lose sight and go blind, your eyes might be damaged, but your ability to perceive vision is still intact. Now, the VEST project was started by Dr. David Eagleman and Scott Novick at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. And I got involved with it through my senior design project with them. The VEST translates sensory information into patterns of vibrations that a user can feel on the torso. Currently, we are testing the use of the VEST for hearing restoration in the profoundly deaf. In this case, we are taking sounds from the environment in real time and mapping it to patterns of vibrations that retain the maximum information for speech information. Now, a person with severe hearing impairment can put on this vest, train with it, and come to develop a direct perceptual experience of sound. Let's see the vest in action. Jonathan, the one with the vest, was born profoundly deaf. He has trained with the vest for four days, and here he is on the fifth day. Scott speaks a word, and Jonathan is able to feel the word as vibrations on his body, and is then able to write the word on the whiteboard. Where? Where? Touch. Touch. Now, these vibration patterns that Jonathan is feeling are complicated for him to be doing this consciously. It seems as if his brain has unlocked the meaning of this new information stream going to his brain through these vibrations. Now, sensory substitution 
has serious implications for restoring hearing, as we've just seen. There are over 360 million people worldwide that experience communicate learning disabilities and economic disadvantages. Now pair the vest with a camera and you can restore vision in the 285 million visually impaired around the world. And most excitingly, we could potentially add new senses like ultrasound or infrared vision. The possibilities are endless. Now, with the vest, we saw how we were able to send sound information associated with hearing to the brain through the sense of touch. But let's take a look at another sensory substitution device that sends information of color that is associated with sight to the brain through hearing. Neil Harbison is, Neil Harbison is an artist who was who is born colorblind and is often considered to be one of the world's first cyborg for having a passport photo of himself with his antenna accepted by the government. His antenna converts visible light frequencies into audible frequencies that allow him to perceive color through sounds. He reports how after continuous use of the sensory substitution antenna, he is able to see this colorful world as a symphony of sounds. Now, sensory substitution is based on our increasing understanding that the human brain is changeable or plastic, allowing it to take in new information streams and make sense of it. Other neurotechnologies depend on our ability to understand what's going on inside our human brain. But how do we know what's going on inside the human brain? The brain is a complex network you. of is a complex network of you. billions of interconnected cells called neurons. Now, these neurons communicate with each other electrically. One way of learning about brain activity is by measuring these electrical signals. EEG or electroencephalography is exactly that. Using electrodes or small pieces of metal placed on the scalp, we are able to measure the brain's electrical activity. These electrical signals, or EEG, represent what's happening inside our brain. And once we know what's happening inside our brain, we can try and change it. For example, say you wanted to prevent yourself from pulling out your phone and checking Facebook every few minutes, we could create a Facebook Crave meter that is connected to your uh, EEG headset. The idea is that we first measure the portion, the parts of your brain that are most active when you feel this urge to check Facebook. And then we put on a headset that monitors how your, how your brain is reacting to this urge. And then this value of the speeder increases when you have an urge and the parts of your brain are active. So the next time you have an urge, you put on an EEG headset and then stare at this meter and then you try to reduce the value through different thoughts and actions. Such a way of training the mind is called neurofeedback. Let's take a look at mind versus might. Another fun neurofeedback example. This is a game that my team at a 24-hour hackathon built. The game involves an arm wrestling robot that is controlled by your thoughts. An EEG headset picks up your, how focused you are on the thought of pushing. The more you think about pushing, the stronger the robotic arm. The game involves you wrestling with the robotic arm while at the same time trying to focus on the thought of pushing. Now the challenge is for your mind to defeat your might. That is, if you lose focus during the game, your might ends up defeating the, arm, the, the robotic arm, which is just an extension of your mind through the EEG headset. Our neurofeedback game trains the user to develop the habit of thinking about pushing. But other neurofeedback games train people other habits. People with attention deficit disorders use neurofeedback games to train themselves to focus. People with uh, drug addiction problems tr use other neurofeedback games that help them train to resist impulsive actions, like we did with the Facebook Crave Meter. Now, 
we are just beginning to explore neurofeedback as a possible treatment for serious brain conditions like anxiety, depression, and migraines. Neurofeedback helps you observe your brain activity so that you can muster your willpower to train your brain to behave in certain ways. Other neurotechnologies use brute force or electricity to directly change what's happening inside your brain. Yes, we are able to alter what's happening inside the brain through electrodes implanted in them that electrically stimulate the region, some regions of your brain. In fact, DBS, or deep brain stimulation, is being widely used to adjust brain activity in, uh, in people with brain disorders like Parkinson's. Parkinson's is a serious degenerative disorder whose symptoms include tremors and muscle rigidity, but its cause is still pretty much unknown. There are an estimated 10 million people worldwide suffering from Parkinson's, and over 100,000 of them have such DBS systems implanted in their brain. DBS is helping those who couldn't tie their shoelaces drive again. And this is where neurotech is like magic. Because while there is strong evidence that it alleviates symptoms and completely transforms people's lives, it is very poorly understood. It seems as if technology is far ahead of the science here. And now we are seeing brain stimulation wearables that you can buy right now off the market that show evidence that they can change your moods from anger to calm, from lethargic to energetic. Again, all the un underlying mechanisms are unknown. The future of brain stimulation is exciting, but we won't nearly reach its full potential until we understand the circuitry within the brain that we are trying to stimulate. The biggest success story of a neurotech device is perhaps the cochlear implant. Installed in over 200,000 deaf people, it is helping them hear by bypassing the damaged portions of their ear. It works by translating sound information into electrical impulses that are, that are delivered directly to the auditory nerve. Now, the cochlear implant is an example of a neuroprosthesis, a device that restores or augments a damaged body part. Most of the prostheses that are currently in use today by amputees are mechanical in nature. That is, say if you had a leg prosthesis, you would control it by moving your knee around. This is not a very natural way of controlling your limb. Neuroprosthetics is an upcoming field that is trying to connect these prosthetic limbs to the nervous system so that amputees can control them using thoughts as if they were the missing limb. But how do you go about attaching a robotic arm to an amputee as if it were a natural extension? The trick is in building neural interface devices between the amputee and the robotic limb. Now, one of the best approaches of creating such a neural interface device involves taking the nerve endings from the site of amputation and moving it to the chest area. The muscles of the chest amplify the neural signals that your brain is sending to the missing arm and then electrodes placed on the chest can then transfer that information to the robotic arm for actuation. This allows for your natural thoughts of controlling the missing arm to control the robotic arm. Users of such neuroprostheses are already reporting how they're able to build sensations of touch in the missing arm through the nerve endings in their chest. Now think about this one more time. We just attached a robotic limb to a human body as if it were a natural extension that you can both control and feel with. Before I conclude, I want to emphasize that before we go on about adding new senses and new body parts, we need to understand how the human brain works. While the neurotech of today is nothing short of amazing, it is helping treat some of the most serious conditions as we've seen with sensory substitution, neurofeedback, brain stimulation, and neuroprosthetics. However, there is large variability in clinical evidence leading to a constant trial and error based adjustment of these technologies. 
The key will be in understanding the underlying mechanisms. And neurotech can both enable that and take advantage of it to improve the human experience. In doing so, neurotech will blur the line between man and machine and redefine what it means to be human. Thank you.